Hey everyone, it's Ornlu, and it's time for another part of State of the Civs 2023. So for those who have not seen the earlier segments, State of the Civs is a short series I do around the start of a new year where we take a holistic look at all of the civilizations in AoE2 right now, assessing not just how balanced they are, but also how cohesive is their design. Basically, do these civs feel like a natural part of the AoE2 roster? Are they unique? Do they have situations where they shine and situations where they struggle? Do their bonuses feel gimmicky or out of place? That sort of thing. In an attempt to quantify these fairly nebulous concepts, Concepts, as well as to keep track of all the different civs in the game, we're going to place everybody on a modified tier list. I explained what I mean by the different tiers in the first part of this series, so be sure to check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Of course, this is episode 3, and since we're going in alphabetical order, today we will be assessing the Dravidians, Ethiopians, Franks, Goths, Kujurs, and Hindustanis. Lastly, if you guys are excited for this breakdown, be sure to leave a like on the video, comment on what you think of the civs we cover, and subscribe to the channel for tons more AoE2 content. With our 90% copy-pasted intro bit complete, let's get into today's reviews. First up today is going to be a new addition to the AoE2 roster, the Dravidians. This infantry and naval civilization was added as part of the Dynasties of India expansion, and therefore possesses certain similarities to the other South Asian civs, namely no knights, siege elephants instead of rams, and elephant archers instead of cav archers. What makes Dravidians unique is that they are the only South Asian civ to specialize in infantry, and to a lesser extent archers, whilst also having some of the worst cavalry in the game. Early on, Dravidians are all about aggression, as the Extra wood upon reaching the next age, and half cost barracks upgrades give you one of the most powerful men at arm rushes on open maps. The potential follow up with faster attacking skirmishers also helps a ton in the current archery range dominated meta in the Feudal Age. Their Arumi Swordsman unique unit can flog multiple enemies at once in a powerful charge attack, which combined with the Woot Steel tech to ignore armor creates one of the highest DPS melee units in the game. Similarly, Dravidian Elephant Archers can fire as fast as Ethiopian Archers, so with this sieve you can really pack a punch. Even if you can't get to those power units, fully upgraded arms, faster attacking elite skirmishers, boot steel halves that are easier to get to, and bombard cannons can always serve you well. Especially for closed maps, having all the gunpowder units and buildings keeps you competitive against most civs. On the water, Dravidians have their fishing bonus and team bonus to help them out in the early game, and their extra wood helps jumpstart them in early feudal age. Things get a bit quiet as far as bonuses go in the mid game, but in the late game you find yourself with a complete dock tech tree, keeps with heated shot, and the mighty Thirasada unique ship, which is basically a huge slow and expensive galleon. Now all of that is great for Dravidians, but as you can see it all hinges around units that are strong and slow. No knights and even lousy battle elephants can cause issues in many situations, and you tend to need to play either very defensively on most land maps or super forward aggression. Also, a lack of an economy bonus past the extra 200 wood upon reaching the next age limits your booming potential, so if your early pressure doesn't get damage done, Dravidians can fall behind civs that play out a bit more smoothly with a better eco bonus and broader tech trees. So like Bengalis and two other civs we'll get to today, Dravidians came out in 2022, so we don't have a reference point for the tier list. Therefore, let's consider how these guys fit into the AoE2 metagame. When they first came out, Dravidians were not remotely popular, as players felt the lack of knights was simply too big of a hole in their tech tree to make up for strong skirmishers, Ellie archers, and infantry. Manganels were just a huge issue in the mid game, and siege onagers or bombard cannons were basically impossible to deal with in the late game. Thankfully, the devs realized this issue and gave the Civ access to bombard cannons in their only post-launch balance change. And yet, we still need to place Dravidians on the tier list. With everything that I've laid out, I'm going to be placing the Civ in the almost there tier. Out of all of the Dynasties of India Civs, Dravidians feel the most like an AoE2 Civ in terms of their bonuses and units. Their tech tree and army compositions feel unique and interesting, and the Civ is viable in plenty of different situations. The only qualm I have with Dravidians is their Castle Age unique tech medical core. The effect is simply too weak to be noticeable in most situations. Either that needs a simple boost to its healing rate, or just to be reworked somewhat. Other than that, Dravidians are looking to be in a good spot these days. Next, we will hop across the Indian Ocean to the Ethiopians. Added as a part of the African Kingdoms DLC, the Ethiopians are classified by the game as an archer civilization, and that is definitely what they are known for. But beyond that, Ethiopians are the glass cannon archer civ, by which I mean that their best units tend to be extremely powerful, but also expensive and fragile. First among the Ethiopian army is always going to be their archers, which with their faster fire rate and access to thumb ring, become some of the very fastest attacking land units in the game. Ethiopians have no other archer bonus or an archer unique unit, but this is enough to catapult them to the top tier of archer civs. Furthermore, Ethiopians are the only civ with a complete siege workshop and siege engineers, and on top of that you have torsion engines to give all of your siege workshop units extra blast radius. Keeping with the theme, Ethiopians have the Shotel Warrior as their unique unit, which is fast, fragile, expensive, and boasts a huge attack. All of these units can struggle to deal with strong cavalry, but thankfully Ethiopians can round out their army with the free pikemen upgrade in the mid game, and then fully upgraded halberdiers in the late game. Naturally, all of these strengths 
experience are tempered by the core weakness of Ethiopians, their lack of long-term eco bonus and overall poor cavalry. Economically, Ethiopians have their extra food and gold upon reaching the next age, which is quite helpful. You can go for a very strong aggressive play in the feudal age with the extra resources, or if you want to play a slower style, you can still get some very nice fast castle timings. That said, the bonus does not help you in the long run, and even compared to other strong archer sibs in AoE 2, Ethiopians have by far the worst economy. As far as the cavalry goes, it is usable in a pinch since you have husbandry, camels, and even hussar, but without bloodlines or plate barding armor, you're generally left with a pretty immobile RB as the Ethiopians. So last year I placed Ethiopians in the something is off tier. I think their overall identity of the individually powerful archers, siege units, and even shotel warriors feels quite unique and interesting, and the general balance is there with the sieve. That said, there are still some clunky parts. Even though the shotel warrior is a cool unit and fits with the Ethiopians theme, in a practical sense, it's one of the most situational castle unique units in the game, as they tend to just be too expensive and fragile to be cost efficient. Relatedly, I'm not generally a fan of unique techs that only affect a unique unit, and Royal Heirs making an already fast training unit train even faster, it's not too strong and it's very boring. Also, the team bonus of extra line of sight for towers and outposts is mediocre in most situations, so that could probably change. Throughout the course of 2022, Ethiopians received no major direct changes, and I really have no reason right now to move them from the something is off tier. Ethiopians are a fun sieve, and they can work in a lot of situations, but there are some aspects of the sieve which just feel a little empty or underwhelming. We have a bit of space to work with here. Moving right along, we go to one of the most classic civilizations in all of AoE 2, the Franks. This sieve was of course part of the original Age of Kings launch, and is classified in-game as a cavalry civilization. I already mentioned this while talking about Britons and Celts, but all three of the original Western European civilizations fill a core archetype in AoE 2. Britons do archers, Celts do infantry and siege, and that leaves cavalry for Franks. This sieve is incredibly streamlined towards cavalry play in general, and has always served as the baseline for what a knight sieve looks like in AoE 2. As to what makes the Franks gameplay so streamlined, it's all about powerful and flexible bonuses that come in at different key points in the game. Early game economy is always a strength with the civilization, as the faster working foragers and free mill upgrades set the player up with the food income needed for a scout rush or a fast castle knights build. Both of these styles are bolstered by the extra 20% HP for cavalry, which can help you win early scout wars or serve as a free bloodlines for knights in the mid game. From there, cheaper castles aid in defending the Franks player if they are behind, or can help checkmate their opponent if ahead. In the late game, Franks of course have their paladins with extra HP and faster production with chivalry, but also possess gunpowder and solid infantry to round out their army composition. Now believe it or not, Franks do have weaknesses, most notably in their tech tree. They possess some of the absolute worst archers in the game, with especially their skirmishers notably missing both Imperial Age blacksmith upgrades. Relatedly, although Frank Light Cav trained quickly with chivalry, you're still looking at worse than generic Light Cav due to missing bloodlines and Hussar. With this sieve, you're generally looking to finish things off before you run out of gold. So last year I ended up placing Franks in the complete tier, because they really are the foundational cavalry civilization in all of AoE 2. They've had quite the swing in balance over the years from being top tier in Age of Kings, to pretty underwhelming in the Conquerors, to back to top tier once the later expansions came out, but now I think we've really landed in a good spot with the sieve. They're very strong on more open and aggressive maps, and absolutely fantastic as a pocket and team game, although I would argue not necessarily an obvious number one pick like Britons are as a flank. But Franks still function just fine on closed maps, and will honestly work at least reasonably well everywhere except water. As you might expect, Franks received no direct balance changes throughout 2022, and are naturally going to stay in the complete tier. I know some of you guys watching may be unhappy about it, as you do see the sieve all over the place on ladder, especially at lower elos. However, I stand by the belief that this is not really because Franks are overpowered, and more that they are very recognizable to most players from Europe and the Americas, and are straightforward to play. They are the Joan of Arc sieve after all. Nevertheless, Franks remain fun to play in a variety of settings. They are the iconic cavalry civilization in the game, but can still be played in a variety of ways thanks to flexible eco bonuses and the castle discount. Very much what I'd consider to be a complete sieve. It's just one memorable sieve after another here, as our next entry is going to be the Goths. This is another classic Age of Kings civilization, and has the infantry sieve designation by the tech tree. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate. Including unique techs, the Goths have five different infantry bonuses, as well as an infantry unique unit. Beyond simply being an infantry sieve, Goths can be characterized as the horde of cheap, cost-efficient infantry units that often lead them to being described as the Zerg of AoE 2, in reference to the StarCraft race. These guys have cheaper infantry that can train very fast and get bonus damage versus buildings, so once you have your economy set up, Goths can just go to town. Facing archers to counter infantry? No problem. The Huskarl unique unit is one of the most powerful in the game, not only because it serves as an anti-archer infantry, but also because it too can be very quickly produced from the barracks. To further help your late game infantry,
infantry spamming needs, Goths get an extra 10 population space for a few extra units and some surprising access to gunpowder and decent hussars as needed. Of course, Goths have some pretty obvious weaknesses. Their tech tree is incredibly limited, having some of the least diverse options in all of AoE 2, with this being most notable in their defenses. No stone walls or guard towers can make getting to the Goth spam rather tricky, especially as the Civ does not have a very powerful economy bonus. Also, the one-trick nature of the Civ gives it a pretty wild matchup spread, and there are many situations when facing other strong infantry civs like Japanese, Vikings, and Slavs where the Goths feel completely helpless. And that brings us to my placement of the Goths last year, which was indeed in the major changes needed tier. As I just alluded to, Goths having such polarizing matchups leads to a lot of very unfun situations for both the Goth player and the not-Goth player, as chances are that one of them is going to be feeling somewhat helpless. Although absolutely steamrolling enemies through unending waves of infantry is fun and leads to a distinct identity, it also just creates these very frustrating experiences, which is not good design in my opinion. But that's only half of it. The other half of the goth problem is their identity as an early laming sieve, particularly in tournament play. This comes from the instantly researching loom, extra attack versus boar, and the cheaper militia for a drush. All of these combine to create a sieve that is really encouraged to go forward, kill the enemy boars, and start walling in their resources. Now, this is tricky, because it totally makes sense for goths to be a strong Dark Age sieve, but at the same time, with all of the polarizing matchups, it's almost like goths need to go forward in a lot of cases. These sorts of games can be fun every now and again, but I don't think it should have to be the norm for any sieve. As for 2022, goths received no direct changes to their balance, and their playstyle certainly has not changed, and therefore they are going to remain in the major changes needed tier. Other than something like Socotra, goths don't really have a particular map type or game mode where they excel, it's more of just getting into a situation where you can go for your infantry spam. I wouldn't ever want that general identity to go away with the goths, but I do think that it could be reined in just a little bit to make the sieve play out more smoothly. Oh boy, our last two sieves today are quite the dynamic duo of controversy, with the first of these being the Gujurs, which is how I was told to pronounce the sieve by my Indian viewers. Regardless, this is a cavalry and camel civilization according to the tech tree, and indeed those are the two unit types that the sieve does best. We'll get to that in a moment, but the first thing you'll encounter when playing as the Gujurs is their Dark Age economy. You can garrison sheep inside of mills, where they will slowly generate food for free. This, combined with the extra starting forage bushes under your TC, means the Dark Age tends to play out a bit differently. You will typically need to push in your deer, but to do so, you'll find yourself with a fair amount of extra resources collected compared to most sieves. Also, in the Dark Age, the Gujurs have the Camel Scout, which is basically an early game version of the Camel Unit. They comfortably beat Scout Cavalry, and you can train them upon reaching the Feudal Age, but honestly, they're too expensive for a Feudal Age unit, so you really only make them on the way up to Castle Age. But man, once Castle Age comes in, this sieve absolutely takes off. Their extra bonus damage camels annihilate cavalry, and their arrow dodging Shrivunch Rider unique unit easily counters archers. These two units together give the Gujurs answers to both cavalry and archers with only a single building and set of upgrades. Infantry could perhaps be problematic without knights, but that's where the final unique unit of the Gujurs comes in, the Chakram Thrower, which is trained at the castle. These guys are like infantry scorpions that deal low pass-through damage and will absolutely annihilate most infantry or clumped up units in general. Beyond those options, Gujurs also possess decent monks, gunpowder, and excellent siege elephants, and all of your military units benefit immensely from the food discount provided by the Kshatriyas tech. So then, what exactly are the weaknesses of this sieve? Well, the Gujurs are tough to counter, but there are things you can do. Double gold army compositions in the mid-game can be an issue for the sieve, as the balancing of which counter unit to go for can lead to the Gujur player absolutely getting rolled. Relatedly, especially since the change to the Chukram Thrower, Gujurs don't really have an inherently powerful unit to go for, and are instead focused on countering what their opponents do. This can make it difficult for the Civ to really press an advantage and destroy their opponent's bases, at least until the Siege Elephants come in. Lastly, Gujurs have really underwhelming trash, missing the Python upgrade like Turks, lacking Ring Archer armor for their Skirmishers, and the Blast Furnace tech for their cheap Hussars. These guys really want to win games before post in. Now, where does that leave us with the Gujurs? Obviously, since the Civ came out last year, I will be placing them on the tier list for the first time now, and I'd say they solidly belong in the somewhat problematic tier. They're definitely a fair bit better than they were at launch, but the Gujurs still feel quite awkward in certain spots. One of the biggest issue areas is the Shrivunshrider unique unit, whose arrow dodging shield is just really weird to play around, as it operates on a recharge meter based on incoming projectiles. This includes all projectiles, not just pierce damage attacks, so everything from Mamelukes to Bombard cannons. It's also just really unfun to play against in a lot of situations. Furthermore, their 
their Camel Scout unit is basically just eye candy, as it's really too expensive to be viable in the early game. Still, like I said, Hujurs are trending in the right direction. The issues related to having tons of sheep garrisoned in mills have been fixed by making the food increase logarithmic instead of linear, Chakram throwers have been reworked to be both more unique and weaker against more armored targets. Don't get me wrong, Hujurs are still rough around the edges, but we are at least slowly getting there. Last, but not least for today, we have the Hindustanis. This is the sieve that used to be called Indians and were originally launched as part of the Forgotten expansion, but with the Dynasties of India DLC, the Sif has been reworked to the Hindustanis we see today. Like the Indians of old, the Hindustanis are classified in-game as a camel and gunpowder civilization, and although this Sif is quite flexible, camels and gunpowder are what they do best. Still, first and foremost, Hindustanis are defined by the economic bonus of progressively cheaper villagers throughout the ages. This is one of the most generally applicable eco-bonuses out there, as you're always going to be making villagers through the early Imperial Age. This isn't to say you get resources faster than other strong economy sieves, but rather you're better able to produce military and economy at the same time, which can be just as powerful. Speaking of military, faster attacking camels that also get bonus damage versus buildings replace knights, as you have no other cavalry stand-in like the Gujaras have with their Shivunch riders. That said, the faster attack speed makes Hindustani camels better at dealing with non-cavalry units, so it's at least a little bit easier. Beyond that, the late game with this civilization is defined by extra armored gunpowder units and long-ranged hand cannoneers, which gives you a stronger, slower-paced playstyle compared to the camels, cav archers, and hussars that the Civ can also go for. And all of this is not mentioning their incredibly powerful unique unit, the Ghulam. These guys replace the old elephant archers of Indians and fill a much more important niche in the Hindustani tech tree. They are speedy anti-archer infantry that can deal a bit of pass-through damage, basically the love child of the Huskarl and the Eagle Warrior. So, like Ujurs, Hindustanis have options to throw against any sort of army composition you can think of. With a strong economy and diverse military, how can one effectively deal with the Hindustanis? Well, the removal of the halberdier certainly helps, as it becomes necessary to have camels to counter cavalry, which is not always going to be an option. Similarly, the lack of arbalest means that you sometimes need to wait until hand cannoneers to deal with infantry, and those obviously don't come online until the late game. Hindustanis are all about strong counter units, similar to Gujars, but unlike the Civ we just talked about, it's a bit more difficult to have those counters on hand at any given time. Therefore, double gold army compositions and big tech switches are going to be really important tools when facing Hindustanis. Now, last year I ended up placing Indians as the only sieve in the fundamental rework tier, and you know what? That's exactly what I got. A lot of the more awkward bonuses of this sieve have been removed, such as the extra pierce armor for cavalry even though they missed plate barding armor, and the problematic villager fishing bonus. Their unique unit feels a lot more impactful and relevant to the tech tree, and Hindustanis now have some actual gunpowder bonuses to make them feel like a gunpowder sieve. They even have the neat Caravanserai unique building to help out trade and team games, which complements the Grand Trunk Road theme quite nicely. So all of this is good and a big improvement in my opinion. That said, it still feels like something is off, and that is exactly the tier I'm going to be placing the Hindustanis now. Honestly, this sieve still feels a bit too strong and flexible. The Ghulam absolutely wrecks sieves like Mayans, and their villager bonus feels like you can always have whatever you need to make with this sieve. I'm not entirely sure which nerfs need to come in, as this is just a tricky sieve to balance, but there is definitely something that needs to be done. But regardless, Hindustanis have come a long way from Indians, and they are thematically more cohesive and generally more balanced. I'll take that any day. And with that, we have completed week three of our sieve reviews. Phew, somehow I was able to do three dynasties of India sieves and goths in a video that's still somehow going to be under 20 minutes. That is about as concise as I could hope for with these sieves. Of course, I'll continue to try to release these once a week every Friday until we get through all 42 sieves in the game. Lastly, I do want to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, with Tristan in the Great Wolf tier, and then Elvenor, Carolyn, and Donnie in the Dire Wolf tier. If you are interested in supporting my channel further and getting some extra perks, the link to my Patreon is always in the description. But as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.